Hello Christian Life Fellowship and others who have joined with us. I'm glad that you can be a part of our message today. We're going to be picking up again in Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to be looking at verses 18 to 21. The title of this message is Walk in the Spirit. Um, but before we get into the message, I want us to go to the Lord in prayer. And with that, I also want to encourage you and I, I hope that you have a wonderful Memorial Day weekend. Um, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Eternal Father and God, we come before you today in the name of your Son, Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, and come in the weakness of our flesh to be strengthened by your word of truth and your abiding spirit. May our lives be fortified by your living and active word, our mortal bodies quickened by your spirit. May our hearts be humbled by the strike of your two-edged sword, that which pierces to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. O oh God, grant the light of your Spirit to illumine our understanding and our hearts and do what you alone purpose. Search us, O oh God, as we desire to draw close to you as you draw us. Heavenly Father, we desire to hear from you, and may our response be as young Samuel saying, Speak, for your servant hears. Father, I thank you for the celebration of Memorial Day here in our country. I thank you for all the men and women who gave their lives for our great country and the liberties that we enjoy. But more so, Father, as a church of Jesus Christ, we are thankful for the liberties that we have and the grace of our Lord and Savior. Thank you. We now humble our hearts before you, Lord God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So we're looking at Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 to 21, and it says this, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Here in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18, we have a fifth way in which believers are to walk carefully. In verse 2 of chapter 5, it tells us to walk in love as we endeavor to be imitators of God. In verse 8, we are to walk as children of light. In verses 15 to 16, we are to walk with wisdom. In verse 17, we are to walk with understanding. And here in verses 18 to 29, we are to walk with spirit-filled lives. Paul opens this section by reminding us of the fountain of healthy relationships, that is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Paul made a connection between the Spirit and relationships already in Ephesians, and here he makes another connection. Uh, after telling us to be filled by the Spirit, Paul gives two one another's. That is, speaking to one another in verse 19 and submitting to one another in verse 21. And here is yet another New Testament example of how a Spirit-filled believer is a person who lives in right relationship with God and right relationships within the Christian community. So Paul begins here in verse 18 by saying, Do not get drunk with wine. These are two commandments that Paul has given us here in verse 18. One is a negative command, do not get drunk, and the other is a positive command, be filled with the Spirit. 
One commentator says, it is the latter, be filled with the Spirit, that is, which is particularly emphasized and which sets the direction for the rest of the passage. The book of Proverbs warns us about drinking, excessive drinking, that is. It says in Proverbs 20 and verse 1 that wine is a mocker and strong drink is a brawler. And whoever is led astray by it is not wise. We are being taught here in Ephesians chapter 5 to live wise, not like the unwise. We are not to live foolish lives. And here the writer of Proverbs tells us that whoever is led astray by the excessiveness of wine is not wise. But here in verse 18 we have what we call a juxtaposition. Paul gives two very contrasting lifestyles to make obvious their major differences, from being drunk with wine to that of being filled with the Spirit. However, the only commonality of the two in getting drunk or being filled is that both are the result of an individual being under the influence. To be drunk is to be filled with alcohol. To be Spirit-filled is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Former influence is destructive, while the latter influence is constructive. Drunkenness is destructive. I, I, we all know that. I'm sure that everyone that uh, is listening to this message has in one way or another been in relations with people's lives who have been touched by alcoholism and drunkenness. Some of you firsthand. Drunkenness has ruined marriages, family relations, finances, and it will eventually ruin the individual if they do not get the help they need. Drunkenness has cost people their jobs, possessions, and the lives of countless innocent people who have died at the hands of a drunk driver. According to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, every day almost 30 die in the United States in drunk driving crashes. Think about that for a moment. That's, that's one person every 50 minutes. Drunk driving crashes claim more than 10,000 lives per year, costing billions of dollars annually, according to this report. So Paul tells us do not be drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. Debauchery is behavior which shows lack of concern or thought for the consequences of an action. These, this is an individual whose actions are senseless and reckless. Senseless and reckless deeds. Paul condemns drunkenness as an utter and senseless waste. The basic idea of the word is wastefulness and is often used in context of moral exhortation to describe a life that is devoid of virtue and represented a waste of time in contrast to one who is to redeem the time. As Christians, we are to redeem the time. Drunkenness being a waste of time, a senseless waste of time and life that is devoid of virtue. One commentator says that drunkenness is one of the sinful deeds of the flesh that are in opposition to the righteous fruit of the Spirit that we find in Galatians chapter 5. And drunkenness is first of all a sin. It develops attendant disease as it ravages the mind and the body but it is basically a sin, a manifestation of depravity. It must therefore be confessed and dealt with as a sin. Drunkenness was one of the sins that Paul dealt with in the Corinthian church concerning communion. Some in that congregation were eating in a gluttonous manner and some were drinking to get drunk. Paul said these individuals were guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. And he goes on to say, that is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have even died. Again, we look to the wisdom of the book of Proverbs 
to give us more insight to the reckless behavior of one who is caught up in the excessiveness of drinking. It tells us in Proverbs chapter 23, beginning with verse 29, Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those who tarry long over wine, those who go to try mixed wine. Do not look at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup and goes down smoothly. Here the, the writer is describing the allurement of it to those who are entrapped by it. In verse 32 it says, In the end it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart utter perverse things. You will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea, like one who lies on the top of a mast. They struck me, you will say, but I was not hurt. They beat me, but I did not feel it. When shall I awake? I must have another drink. <laughs> it's really not funny, is it? Uh, when we see a life that has been ravished by the excessiveness and lack of control in drinking and living in drunkenness. In the United States, back in the early 1900s, we had what was known as prohibition. Prohibition in the United States was a nationwide constitutional ban on the production, importation, transportation, and sale of alcoholic beverages from 1920 to 1933. And we know that prohibitionists first attempted to end the trade in alcoholic beverages early in the 19th century. National prohibition of alcohol, uh, some called the Noble Experiment, was undertaken to reduce crime and corruption, and to solve social problems, reduce the tax burden created by prisons and poorhouses, and was intended to improve health and hygiene in the United States. Prohibitionists, though, the problem here was they attempted to cure an inward sin problem by treating external behavior, which is a result of sin in the heart. And we know that only God can heal our sin problem. Only God can heal the alcoholic. And I'm not taking anything away from all of the programs out there that are meant to help people with addictions to get well. But only God can truly deliver, only God can truly heal the sin problem of any individual and society. The prohibitionists were called dries, and the anti-prohibitionists were called wets. Dries and wets, there, there's always uh, pros and antis uh, in about every, every aspect of life, isn't there? But prohibition failed, and it led to other forms of substance abuse in our country. Um, and, and the interesting fact is when prohibition was first uh, instituted in the United States, Democrats and Republicans were on board with it together. Imagine that. Imagine. But what does the Bible say about drinking? We know that drunkenness is prohibited, but Scripture does not prohibit drinking. A drink, I should say. And this topic uh, has been a controversial issue in the church and across denominational lines for hundreds and hundreds of years. There are those Christians who understand that Scripture teaches that a drink is not prohibited, but it must be done in moderation. We'll call them the wets. <laughs> and there are Christians who believe, firmly believe, that other Christians should not touch alcohol no matter the amount or at any time, period, and for various reasons. We'll call them dries. We have the wets and the dries in the church of Jesus Christ, believe it or not. But what does the Bible say here? Uh, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 10.23, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful or profitable. 
All things are lawful, but not all things build up or edify. And we need to take that into consideration personally and collectively as the church of Jesus Christ. I like the way the Amplified Bible states it here in 1 Corinthians 10.23. It says, all things are legitimate, permissible, and we are free to do anything we please. But not all things are helpful. Not all things are expedient, profitable, and wholesome. All things are legitimate, but not all things are constructive to character and edifying to spiritual life. Um, I, 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 I like the way it puts it here, but I think we also need to realize as Christians that there are boundaries and limitations here. We are, we are not really free to do anything we please as Christians. And as a pastor, I have been asked concerning this topic on numerous occasions, and I'm sure as many pastors have. And I want to make, make it clear, I do not advocate drinking whatsoever. That's not what this is about. I have my own convictions that have been a safeguard throughout my life. And personally, I feel that it would be a compromise to ministry to draw upon any association with worldly vices. And personally, I think drinking is a worldly vice. I believe that there are multiple factors involved before a Christian arrives at the decision to have a drink, and they would do well to prayerfully consider them. I, I believe that back in the time of Jesus, and going even back further into the Old Testament, that wine was naturally fermented. Uh, I don't believe, and I could be wrong, uh, but I don't believe distillation was even invented then. There was no enhancement of the process to make alcohol a stronger drink, such as whiskey uh, that we have in our day. But there was a natural fermentation I like what one commentator says concerning this topic. He says, drunkenness and addiction are not a mere innocent loss of control. They are the destructive waste of life that ought to be lived unto God. Paul's real concern is the avoidance of debauchery, excessive and wasteful indulgence. He goes on to say, if we as Christians choose to drink alcohol, we must make sure that it is a carefully monitored amount, and that our witness is not compromised by our actions. The greater the abuse in a given culture, the less Christians should take part. He goes on to say, obviously, the prohibition of drunkenness extends to abuse of drugs, but it also applies to any excessive indulgence. Humans were created to live in relation with God, and any practice that diminishes a person's awareness of God and ability to respond to Him and that suggests a life out of control stands under the indictment of the text. What this commentator is saying is that not only drunkenness, but any drug or any indulgence, anything that we do that takes away from or diminishes a person's awareness of God and ability to respond to Him. And that can begin now causing us to look downward and saying, yeah, okay, I'm starting to hear what is being said. Any form of indulgence. Uh, to some people, drinking too much coffee does more damage to your body than having a glass of wine. And I know, I know you don't want to hear that, and um, some don't want to hear that, but we need to consider this. And we as a church family... The body of Christ is not to judge another brother or sister who decides that they can exercise that grace and liberty in Christ. I know that from my own upbringing, personally, uh, from the tradition, operative word here, from the tradition of my upbringing, I was always taught and I believed for a long time that any form of alcohol consumption was a sin. And there are many things that we attach to our traditional upbringing that we really need to take before God and lay on the altar. And again, I remind you, I am not advocating drinking whatsoever. But there are those who 
who feel that they have that liberty and grace to do so, and we should not judge them. So what does Paul say? Paul says, be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. This is the positive command, and this is a constructive command. Those who are drunk fill themselves with wine. And on the contrary, the believer is filled with the Spirit of God. You see, the drunk fills himself with wine. The believer is filled by and with the Spirit of God. Being controlled by the Holy Spirit, says MacArthur, is absolutely essential for living the Christian life by God's standard. God's way cannot be properly understood or faithfully followed apart from the working of the Spirit in the life of a believer. So we are to be filled with the Spirit, living according to God's standard. And MacArthur says that we cannot properly understand or faithfully follow God apart from the working of the Spirit in our life. Period. This is what Paul has been getting to throughout chapter 5. For the believer to be filled with the Holy Spirit is to live a life according to God's standard. To be filled with the Spirit is to not find yourself living in a lifestyle of sin. And I need to remind you that Paul is speaking to the church here. We don't know if there were people in that congregation that were exercising drunkenness in their behavior. We know that in the Roman Greco world, at that time period, in that culture, drinking and drunkenness was quite promoted. And maybe some were exposed to that, and Paul had to deal with this issue. But Paul is saying that we are to be filled with the Spirit. For the believer to be filled with the Holy Spirit is to live a life according to God's standard. And the results being that their lives will be a reflection of the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through them. When we first become concerned about being filled with the Spirit, rather than other things, then it will be easier for us to understand what the will of God is. And it is interesting to me personally how we as a church, the body of Christ, would rather get more caught up in what others can or cannot do than to give utmost attention to what we all should be doing, that is, i.e., be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. What does that look like for you and me, to be filled with the Spirit? What does it look like to be walking with Spirit-filled lives? It tells us in Ephesians 1 through 4, 1 through 3, yes, I keep going back to Ephesians, I do. Um, in, in Ephesians 4, 1 to 3, it teaches that we are to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. With all humility... We are to walk with all humility and gentleness, with patience bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Now, now listen to that for just a moment. We are, to, we are to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. If you're a Christian, you've been born again, you've been purchased and ransomed by the blood of Jesus Christ, you must walk in a manner worthy of that calling with humility, with gentleness, with patience. With one another, by the way. This is how we have to treat one another as well. With humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love, not in frustration, not in, not in uh, a lack of patience, not in a lack of gentleness, <laughs> eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That's what that looks like. That's what the Spirit-filled life looks like in the body of Christ. And I need to remind you again in Ephesians 1.13 that we have been filled with the Holy Spirit when we came to Jesus Christ we were, we were born again. It says here in Ephesians 1.13, In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, when you heard the word of truth, when you heard the gospel of salvation, 
and believed in him and you believed in Jesus, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who was the guarantee of our eternal inheritance until we acquire possession of it. To the praise of his glory. To the praise of the glory of God in the Son, in our Savior. One commentator says that the hallmark gift of the new covenant is the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. The hallmark gift of the new covenant is the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. Paul calls believers to yield their lives completely to the Spirit's influence and to resist coming under the pull of other mind-altering and numbing substances. Get away from the Spirit-filled life keeps their eyes upon Jesus looking full in his wonderful face, and the things of this earth grow strangely dim. Galatians 5, 16 through 17 says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. When you want to serve God wholeheartedly, you want to do what is right, good, and true, know that the flesh is going to be in opposition to that. It's going to be tempting you, speaking little whispers in your heart, in your ear, to not do those things. And when you go to sin, when you go to fall into that temptation, you're going to feel a sense of conviction and shame. That's the Holy Spirit opposing your flesh. And we must look and cry out to the Lord for deliverance. R. Kent Hughes says this uh, concerning drunkenness and being filled with the Spirit. He said the mention of drunkenness and being filled with the Spirit may suggest an exact parallel. But this is not so. For the parallels between drunkenness and the filling of the Spirit are merely superficial he says it is true that when someone is drunk, he is under the influence. And when one is filled with the Spirit, he is under the Spirit's influence. But the comparison ends there, and the rest is contrast. Being filled with the Spirit is not a kind of spiritual intoxication in which we lose self-control. For self-control is a fruit of the Spirit that we find in Galatians. We know that in Acts chapter 2 and verse 13 on the day of Pentecost, the disciples were accused of being filled with new wine, by only, but only, rather, by those who criticized them. They were mocking them, it tells us in the scriptures. The disciples, upon being, upon being filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. We find that in Acts 2.4. This other tongues, though, was a known tongue to those in Jerusalem that day. Men from every nation under heaven were in Jerusalem, Acts 2.5. And they were bewildered, it says, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. You can find that in Acts 2, 5 to verse 12. They declared, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. So that unknown tongue to the disciples at the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was actually a known tongue to those in and around Jerusalem that day. Those who are filled with the Spirit are not drunk with the Spirit as we see here in reference to drunkenness. There is no correlation to this degree whatsoever. The Spirit-filled life is a life under the control and influence of the Holy Spirit. There is no slurring of speech or stumbling around as though inebriated, and there is no shame in being filled with the Spirit. It is right and it is pleasing to the Lord to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Christians are to live in the fullness of the Spirit. What we have here in verses 19 to 21 is to be seen as a result describing the outworking of the Spirit's filling in the life of the believer. 
A pastor I sat under years ago and for a short time used to say concerning the outworking of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer, he would say it is the outflow of the overflow of the inflow of the Holy Spirit in the life of that individual. And I think that says it well. That says it well. So in verse 19a, it tells us addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Three terms we have here, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. The reference here is to Christian fellowship. And the mention of psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs indicates the context of public worship. The context here is public worship. We speak to one another, addressing one another. When singing, believers not only sing to God, there is also a horizontal dimension in which believers encourage and strengthen the faith of one another. That's, that's what part of worship is all about in the body of Jesus Christ. And this is a wonderful example of true Christian fellowship. This is the body of Christ reaching out, encouraging one another in the fellowship. Many people go to public worship, they go to church to be entertained, or, or some are mere sideline spectators to the church service. And this is not what is intended here whatsoever. God didn't call anyone to be born again to be a spectator of the spiritual blessings that we have as children of God. We go to public worship to address, to encourage one another, and to worship the Lord. And our worship is in singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and hearing the Word of God. Singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. All believers should be involved with corporate singing and worshiping the Lord with all your heart. Thankfully, he says, with all your heart and not with all your voices. <laughs> Heartfelt singing and worship is directed to the Lord, our Savior, and our Redeemer. For Christ alone is worthy of our praise and our adoration. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Blessed be his holy name is the praise and worship song of the host of heaven we find in Revelation. J.B. Phillips says it like this, making music in your hearts for the ears of the Lord. We worship God from our hearts. We, the, the, those who come to church are part of the fellowship of the body of Christ who do it just verbally, that's very superficial. Remember, God is looking at the heart. True worship and praise comes from the heart. Now, that doesn't mean we all have to get up and sing to the top of our lungs. We can sing in, in a low whisper. We can sing in our hearts, but we must be sincere in our hearts and make it go Godward. Lift it heavenward, I should say. John Stott adds to what Philip says. He says, instruction from which unmusical people able to sing in tune have always derived much comfort. <laughs> Given thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. We are to give thanks constantly, constantly. Constant gratitude to the Father, says one commentator, for all that he has done for his people in and through the Lord Jesus Christ should be a defining characteristic of the lives of all believers. Constant gratitude to the Father for all that he has done for his people in and through the Lord Jesus Christ should be a defining characteristic in the lives of all believers. Believers, and we are to give thanks for everything. First Thessalonians 5:18 says, "Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you." We are to thank God for His many blessings of provision and protection. 
We are to thank God for the trials of suffering and difficulty that he allows and brings into our lives that we find in James 1, 2. And we know from Romans 8, 28, that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. In your life, child of God, God is working good in whatever situation, whatever circumstance you find yourself in. And God would have us to go to him with hearts of gratitude, thanking him for what he is doing in our lives. Because if we are faithful and obedient and yielded to him, we will glorify his name in the outcome. Now, this is not to claim that God is the author of evil or that we are praising him for what he abominates, says one commentator. But we recognize that he uses even the suffering which comes upon us to produce character, perseverance, and hope. And a life filled with thanksgiving will find spontaneous expression in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. We are to give thanks to God the Father in the name of Jesus our Lord. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes unto the Father except through me. Jesus is the door to the Father. Jesus is our reconciliation to the Father. Jesus, just as Jesus taught his disciples to pray to the Father in his name, so Paul here instructs his, instructs his readers to utter their expressions of praise and gratitude to the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thanksgiving should be rendered to our God and Father in the name of Jesus Christ. God, our Heavenly Father, is glorified in the Son. He's glorified in Jesus. And if we are to glorify the Father, it is in Jesus in which we do that. In John 14, 13, Jesus says, Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified and the Son. In Hebrews 13, 15, it says, Through Him, through Christ, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge His names. Every born again Christian, every believer, should bring forth the fruit of their lips in praise and acknowledge in the name of Jesus to glorify our Heavenly Father. We are to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Verse 21 here of Ephesians 5 is a hinge verse that goes all the way through chapter 6 and verse 9. One commentator says, Believers whose lives have been filled by God's Spirit will be marked by submission within divinely ordered relationships. We need to, to listen to this carefully. The key verb used here means literally to arrange under. Submission, submit or submission, to arrange under. It regularly functioned to describe the submission of someone in an ordered array to another person who was above the first in some way. For example, the submission of soldiers in an army to those of superior rank. Those, those of lesser were to be arranged under the greater submission. Sometimes a person who claims to be filled with the Spirit becomes aggressive, self-assertive, and brash. But the Holy Spirit is humble, is a humble spirit. And those who are truly filled with him always display the meekness and gentleness of Christ. That is, walking in a manner worthy of the calling in which we have been called. It is one of their most evident characteristics to submit to one another. That's, that's a, a, a wonderful example of the love of Jesus Christ. Our mutual submissiveness is out of reverence for Jesus. We submit to others because Christ is the ultimate authority over our lives. And didn't Jesus set the example for us? He didn't come to serve. He didn't come to be served. He came to serve. I better get that right at this point. We belong to Christ's kingdom. He is the king. 
And out of reverence for him, we gladly submit to his rule and serve others with compassion. All that we find ourselves doing just that. To have the heart and compassion for one another that Jesus has for us and his church. We should exhibit that. And we need to ask ourselves every day, possibly, are we right there? Do we have the heart of Jesus Christ in all things, in the way we treat people, in the way we greet people, in the way we fellowship with other members of the body of Christ? In conclusion, how we live as followers of Jesus Christ truly and eternally matters in our day-to-day -day communion with him and with the world around us. It truly matters. It matters how we follow him. To walk in the fullness of the Spirit is a life that is pleasing to the Lord by one who understands what the will of the Lord is. One who is looking carefully how they walk. Walking according to the manner in which they have been called. Can the Christian truly do this? Can they walk in the manner of which they have been called? And can we truly understand the will of God? Absolutely we can. God's word teaches us that this is so, and God will keep his word, God will keep his promise to his children. To be filled with the Spirit is walking in love, walking in the light, walking with wisdom, walking with understanding, and walking with Spirit-filled lives. The Spirit-filled believer is a person who lives in a right relationship with God and in right relationships within the Christian community. This, in the life of the believer, is imitating God in Christ Jesus. Amen. I pray that the Word of God encourages you today. I pray that your hearts are lifted up. I pray that you would spend time with the Lord today, throughout the week, asking God how you can better reflect the inflow, overflow, and outflow of the working of the Holy Spirit in your life. For we must all reflect the power of God at work in us. Be encouraged in Jesus Christ. Don't get your eyes on the things around you. Don't let your ears hear all, all that is going on around you. We walk by faith and not by sight. Keep your eyes upon Jesus Christ. He will see us through. Amen.